Clinton. It was written in Northern California, the guy in this was the Assembly of God, and uh, the last four or five years by way of Arizona and I think a few other parts of the country. And, um, and I'm going to read something that Pastor Sean prepared. So uh, I hope it's all right. So uh, he's with Leadership Development, Pastoral Care, and Church Planting Director for the Northern California Nevada District of the Assembly of God. Been a successful church planter and pastor. And I found this line to be interesting. I shared this with the Pastor Powell this morning. And currently lives with his wife, Dr. Cindy. <laughs> so let's go to Adobe. Welcome to Cal State. Thank you. Thank you. We working? We up? All right. Well, it's good to be here with you today. Uh, yeah, that currently with Dr. Cindy, we've been married almost 40 years, and currently she's keeping me around now that she's a doctor. And I bought her a shirt after she got her doctorate last year that says, I'm a doctor now, just, uh, just uh, consider that everything I say is right. And I'm like, well, we, I've been doing that for 39 years, honey. So. <laughs> but anyway, it's good to be here with you. I bring greetings. Uh, from our district superintendent, Brett Allen. Uh, we are a, a district of churches that starts just north of Fresno, goes all the way up to the Oregon border and all of Nevada, 220,000 square miles, 467 churches and close to 1,500 ministers. So when we meet together this morning, and I always think like this when I drive up to a to a church is this is one congregation of many that uh, are in not only in our network but one congregation of many that are in California that are pointing the same direction that believe that Jesus Christ is Lord that believe that God is doing a work in our lives and it looks a lot of different ways uh, some people are all masked up like you guys are this morning uh, in Las Vegas, they don't know that there's COVID typically. Uh, and in Placerville, I went and took a pastor out to eat at Placerville the other day, and there was a big banner in front of one of the restaurants that says, no mask allowed. So, you know, both ends of the spectrum. And it's a pretty crazy world that we live in, especially when COVID is very real, especially when we look at the past two years that have gone by, I don't know about you guys, they've gone by just like this, and now we find ourselves here today in 2022, but with a lot of great things, I believe, that God has in store for us. You know what? Things have changed. Things are different. There's a shift that's taken place. But at the same time, I believe that God has a great work that he wants to do in each and every one of us and in Petaluma as a whole. I love this community. I drove in this morning, drove through uh, Highway 12 through Napa and came through and it reminded me of when my wife and I went through Ireland together. Just really green and beautiful and lush. And uh, we'll, we'll just pray that all the grass doesn't dry up and turn brown again, <laughs> even though we know that's gonna happen. So, but as we find ourselves at the beginning of a new year, we have a lot of dreams and plans for what 2022 will be like. I remember years ago, I always used to make resolutions at the beginning of the year of what I wanted to do, of what I wanted to see take place through that year. And some of them were very good. I wanted to learn, you know, Spanish and other ones were very crazy. Like I wanted to be able to dunk a basketball. Uh, you know, the truth is I haven't done any either of those, even though those have been resolutions for years. But, but there's a certain dream that each of us have down deep inside of our hearts of what we want the future to look like, of really what we want our lives to look like. And as we go through life, we, we many times have that dream out in front of us. And it's like, man, I want to be able to live that dream. I want to be able to get it to that place where, where it's easy living, where things are good. Uh, I'll admit to you that I went out uh, just before Christmas and bought every person in our family a Powerball ticket. <laughs> I mean, it's $540 million. Of course, when I handed them out on Christmas Day, I made them promise that they were gonna share with the rest of the family. 
But, uh, and we didn't, by the way, we, none of us wanted to dine. We didn't, I think one, one of our family matched one numbers of all the things that were there. But you know, people have this mentality of, you know, if I just had a little more money, if I just had a little more opportunity, thing, all these things would change. I don't know how many of you watch HGTV, but there's a show on. In fact, I looked it up last night because it's kind of been out there. It's called My Lottery Dream Home. You guys ever watch that? And uh, there's a very flamboyant uh, uh, commentator that's there and he goes and people win the lottery and they come to him and he goes and helps them find, he asks them, how much money do you want to spend? And then they go and find uh, this dream home. And it's interesting what they're looking for. In fact, it's interesting because the ones that have won multi-millions of dollars in the lottery don't want to spend multi-million dollars for their dream home. They're very, very conservative. They've got a long range plan. You know, we want to spend a million dollars or 1.5 million or whatever it is. And they set them up with this home and other ones that win like seven, eight hundred thousand dollars They want to spend it all. We want to spend the whole thing. Let's go for the gold. So, but it's very interesting what they look for. And it's very interesting the opulence that they lock into compared to where they were before because there's that dream inside. If I just had a little more and they get a little more, then this is what we're going to do with it. You know what? It's an awesome feeling to have nice stuff. It's an awesome feeling to be well and to be carefree and to, to just be able to, to, to be happy, to feel like everything is going our way. And really this desire isn't anything new. It's been happening since the beginning of creation. Today, we're gonna to be checking out a portion of scripture. It's in Matthew chapter eight and verse 18 through 27. If you guys wanna follow along with me today. And, uh, and in the scripture, we find the disciples basking in the spotlight. Uh, Jesus, on the other hand, is bordering on exhaustion. Uh, you know anything about this portion of scripture? It's uh, the very end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is uh, there. There's thousands of people that are there that are listening to his message. And Jesus is presenting this message, but he is really tuckered out by the time he gets to chapter eight. In fact, really, we think about it. We think about great big room and, you know, we got thousands of people in here and here Jesus is and he's got a, he got a headset on and man, he's just sharing and sharing all this scripture. But the truth is, is that everybody's spread out in this great big field on the mountainside and the message is is really coming out of Jesus as he meanders through the crowd and he's not just talking about people, but he's talking with people. I believe that he, as he comes up to a group of people, it might be a family, it might be a, a group of peers and friends that are, are together, he senses in his spirit what they need and exactly what the issue is taking place in their lives. And that is what comes out in that portion of scripture. In fact, actually, if you break down the Sermon on the Mount, there's like chat or paragraph after paragraph after paragraph that are unique thoughts and unique presentations. And I really believe that this is what it was about. It wasn't like we're even experiencing today. You might be able to hear Jesus for maybe 10 or 15 minutes, but he's meandering through the crowd as he shares this message. And as he's doing this, you, you consider the fact with a crowd like that and with Jesus wanting to go through and be able to minister to everybody, we're talking hours, not just maybe 30 minutes. We're talking four, five, eight hours that Jesus is meandering through the crowd and that there is just a ministry that is pouring out of him as he comes in contact with people. And the more that he does that physically, there's only so much that you can handle. Uh, uh, Amanda and I were talking earlier in the church where they were at in Rio Vista. Sean was speaking at three services. And as Pastor Sean speaks that many services, I can relate. We did three, four services at the, the last pastor that I was at. 
Man, by the time you're done, my wife can never figure out, why don't you ever want to go out to eat for lunch? It's like you're always tired. And I'm just like hanging on, and I'm like, because I am tired. But I can imagine what Jesus was experiencing as he had spent hours and hours meandering through this crowd. He had shared this long message that thousands of people left the mountainside, ministered and healed all the way over back to Peter's house. And now that there's a now there's a crowd that's gathering there too, and Jesus just wants to get away and catch his breath. Jesus just wants to get a little rest. So let's check out the story as it unfolds in the book of Matthew. First of all, Jesus is tired. You have that slide up there? Jesus is tired. Matthew chapter 8, verse 19 says. Uh, when Jesus saw that a curious crowd was growing by the minute, he told his disciples to get him out of there and to the other side of the lake. If you're looking and can't find that, that, those exact words in your Bible, I'm using the New Living Translation this morning. Some people just want to be where life is easy. Have you met people like that? You know, Jesus is tired, but there's other people that are in the story that just want to ride the wave. Uh, where they want to be in a place where there's blessings and miracles taking place. In fact, really, with all the people that were on the mountainside, with all the people that were involved in, in hearing Jesus' ministry, it's estimated that when Jesus ascended and went back up into heaven, that there was only about 500 followers that Jesus actually had on the earth. You might be scratching your head and saying, what happened to the thousands of other people? They were just kind of riding the wave. They were going along and it's like, hey, we want to be healed. We want to be happy. We want to be fed. We want to see the, 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 the things that are taking place, almost the Jesus show, if you could call it that. We just want to be able to be there and be where everything is happening. We want our stomachs to be full. We don't want to have a care in the world. And I'm sure this is what the disciples were feeling because you look at this portion of scriptures and think about it. They actually had a backstage pass to the Jesus show. Everything where the Jesus went, his disciples were there. Those 12 disciples, Jesus laid down and went to sleep, his disciples were there. Jesus was out in the middle of a large crowd, the disciples were there. And you know what, you can't help, especially as you look at their personalities, you can't help but think that maybe they had just a little bit of pride and just a little bit of attitude going on kind of maybe did the little strut thing and making sure that they look good and that they were right behind Jesus so that as people look at Jesus they saw them too. We've all seen people on, on TV that have done that. You know, they're interviewing somebody and somebody's over there photobombing everybody and waving and <laughs> holding up signs and stuff like this. Maybe it was very similar to what the disciples were feeling. They were feeling almost on the verge of being arrogant because they were a part of the entourage of Jesus. They had a, not only had a backstage pass, but every time he drew a crowd, they were in their inner circle and had the best seats. And now that Jesus was here and he said, hey, I'm tired, get me out of here. Now all of a sudden what's going on in their head, it isn't about getting Jesus out of there. It's now we're gonna go on a lake cruise. <laughs> Now we're going to have a good time. Everybody else is going to get left on the shore and we're getting in the boat with Jesus. And we're going to leave everybody behind. And, and they might have looked back even as at the shore as the people were gathered along the shore, maybe even in the water and just kind of did this kind of arrogant thing like, look at us. Look, we're really, we're really big guys now. Look at what's happening. But there's an interesting contrast. We check out Jesus, and there are crowds gathering around him, but he gets more exhausted physically by the minute. You know, really, when we think about Jesus, we need to understand that not only was he 100% God, but he was also 100% man. He was the balance between God and man that was there. And his response, get me out of here, wasn't that he didn't love people, but he realized his capacity. He realized his limitations physically and really needed to just be able to catch his breath. See, really, when we look at it, Jesus didn't come to be popular, but Jesus came to save the world. The main thing that we find here is to go to the next slide. It's found in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 19 through 22. 
It says there, as they left, a religion scholar asked if he could go along. I'll go with you wherever, he said. And Jesus was curt. Are you ready to rough it? We're not staying in the best end, you know. And another follower said, Master, excuse me for a couple of days, please. I have my father's funeral to take care of. But Jesus told him, follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. We need to understand here that Jesus' response to both of these men wasn't about being rude or lacking compassion. He was just shooting straight. You notice that, and it happens in all of our lives, when we're tired and exhausted physically, really most of the time, that's when we really, really shoot straight. That's when we really let it lay out and say, hey, you know what, let me just call it straight here. This is really what's happening. And in this portion of scripture, this is where we find Jesus. Sure, that, that this religious ruler, he was caught up in the moment, wanted to ride on Christ's coattails, but Jesus made it plain that this was a tough way to live. You know, the portion is, uh, the scriptures that we find that talk about this, the life of Jesus, say that he didn't even have a place to lay his head. He didn't have his own house. He didn't have his own uh, uh, place that he could go and just uh, find, a, find a place of solace and find a place of a solitary confinement. But he had to go and be basically at the women call of everybody that was around him, even his disciples. And when he went and he was looking for a place to, to, uh, to catch his breath, sometimes he had to go out in the wilderness. Sometimes he had to go, uh, as it were, hide, or in this case, get on the other side of the lake just to be able to find a break. And he's sharing with this follower, you know what? You know, it's great that you want to follow me, but this is not an easy way to live. And the same with the, the man whose father had passed away. Jesus wasn't being rude, but he was just trying to bring focus on the kingdom. He was trying to put the focus on the main thing. He was trying to make the difference plain between the eternal and the temporal. And really, when the, we look at our lives and we look at the world that we live in today, it's becoming much more obvious of the eternal and the temporal. It's becoming much more focused, and I know in my life, of really what are the things that are going to last and what are the things that are going to change tomorrow. We look at, well, let's talk about COVID because you guys all got masks on this morning. I'm the only one in here without a mask. That's, uh, that's kind of weird. In fact, I went to a service the other day and a pastor was actually wearing a mask. It was a little muffled when he was trying to speak. But, but, uh, but, but really, we look at COVID. Everything changes, it seems like, week by week. One minute, you know, it seems like everything's waning, and the next thing, it's like we're off the charts of people that are that are uh, contacting COVID and and uh, ending up in the hospital and all the other things. And really, the numbers are showing that even we in, here in California are doing good compared to other states. But you know what? There's changes that are constantly there, and I think the perspective for each of us is to be able to look and say, you know what? What really is eternal? Or what's going to be here now, but it'll be gone tomorrow? What's, what's, what's really important in life, and especially as we start a brand new year off, it is gauging everything back and saying, you know what, let's get a fresh perspective on really what life needs to be lived out like in 2022. Jesus here, I believe, is, is not only was he emphasizing the difference between eternal and temporal, but I believe this is still what Jesus tries to stress in each of our relationships with him. Our calling, our purpose, our relationship is made clear when the going gets rough. When it's easy, man, sometimes we lose focus, but when things begin to tighten down and things start getting rough and people start getting sick around us or the bills are having a hard time getting paid or the car isn't working or there's something that happens in our house that we can't afford to fix, that's really when focus starts to take place. And I believe when push comes to shove as followers of Christ, we're called to have God and the things of God is the priority in our lives. Jesus had just presented this in his Sermon on the Mount. In fact, in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, it speaks there in that portion of scripture, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and God will give you everything that you need. 
Jesus understood the perspective that was needed for people to live a consistent life and relationship with his father. And really, if you break down this portion of scripture, the kingdom of God, I always used to think the kingdom of God was heaven. That, that's where I wanted to go. I wanted to go to the kingdom of God. But the thing is, the kingdom of God is the realm of salvation. It's the realm of relationship with Christ. So if you look at this, seek relationship with Christ above all else and live righteously. What is living righteously? It's, it's not just living by a set of rules, but it's living by our conscience of what God's spirit speaks to us and says, you know what? You should probably not do that or you should do that. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember the old... Well, first of all, black and white TVs. Any black and white TVs in here? Okay, I'm one friends. And then, uh, and then on top of that, I remember cartoons where where there was a guy trying to make a decision, and a little angel was on one shoulder and a little devil on the other. And the angel would say, "Don't do that." And the devil on the other shoulder goes, "Oh, go ahead, go for the gold, go ahead and go blast past this and do it." And the angel's like, "No, you just really in in the spiritual realm. That's probably." more correctly what's happening in each of us on a regular basis. We have those voices. We have those forks in the road that we have to make a decision to go one way or the other way. And really, as we look at this portion of scripture, living righteously is living to listening to the Holy Spirit in our life as he gives us direction on which ways to go. As we look at a brand new year that God's given us, that is, I believe, probably the greatest resolution that we could have is, God, I'm going to listen to your spirit and I'm going to go your way this year. I'm going to have my heart open so that when it comes to those forks in the road, then I'm going to go your way. And we see what happens here. Seek relationship with God above all else. Listen to God's spirit in our heart and God will give you everything you need. You want to have a, a formula for having a great year? Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Right down the line is that formula for each of us. But you know what, as we look at what was taking place here, and Jesus has talked to these two guys that wanted to cross the, the shore with, or cross the lake with him. Uh, Jesus talked to them about the focus that they needed to have. He talked to them about really what's, what's the most important in their lives. And then uh, we find the disciples now out on the boat, out on the lake cruise as it were with Jesus. And we see here in the next slide, it speaks here and says that Jesus got in the boat, his disciples with him. The next thing they knew, they were in a severe storm with waves crashing into the boat. Now storms, if you look at this lake that is in Israel, storms are very, very common on this lake in particular. In fact, they come out of nowhere. You know, you'll take off and it'll be very, very sunny. And by the time, just like the disciples experience, they get halfway across the lake. All of a sudden, the waves are high and the wind's blowing and it's raining and it's just terribly. And historically, storms could come up sudden like this one. In fact, that's real similar to what we experience in our lives. You know, who would have known that two years ago, uh, we would have a pandemic that would be racing across the United States where over a million Americans had passed away and millions of others that had passed away in the earth. And let's just screw it down just a little more. Who would have thought three weeks ago that the O'Kellys would have had COVID go all through with their families? Who would have thought that? You know, who would have thought that some of the things that are changes that just happened that quick would take place? I live up above Auburn, California, up by 80. And who would have thought that on Christmas Day, we actually had our power go down and I ran out and hooked the generator into the house and got it all cranked up and we got the power back again. And our power outage was only for about an hour, but two blocks away, those people were a week. And I have friends of mine that are 20 miles away in some of our churches that this morning they have no power. They're not doing church. In fact, PG&E says they probably won't even show up at the earliest tomorrow and maybe the end of the week before they even start coming into their community. Who would have known those things? But those things happen. And those things, changes take place quick. Sometimes the kids are sick. Sometimes the car breaks down. Sometimes the bills are piling up. 
all of those things that just come out of the blue. And this is very similar to where we find the disciples. One moment is beautiful, and all of a sudden, everything changes. In Matthew chapter 8, uh, the next portion of Scripture says, verse 25, waves were crashing in the boat, and Jesus was sound asleep. You notice the exclamation mark. It's interesting that Matthew, one of the disciples, puts an exclamation mark because he can't <laughs> believe that Jesus isn't waking up in the middle of the storm. And they roused him up, pleading, Master, save us. We're going down. And Jesus reprimanded them. Why are you such power, such faint hearts? And he stood up and told the wind to be silent, and the sea to quiet down. Silence. The sea became smooth as glass. The men rubbed their eyes, astonished. What's going on here? Wind and sea come to heal at his commands. We look at the disciples. They're excited and fearful. Jesus is sound asleep. Uh, uh, they woke him up. He reprimanded him. Jesus spoke to the wind and seemed to chill out everything. And these disciples are in love. They just don't get it. What in the world just happened? Here we're one minute out here and the storm is, is raging and the waves are crashing into the boat. And, and we wake Jesus up and he stands up and gets mad at us because we woke him up. Wasn't he getting wet in the boat? And then he tells us, man, you, you guys are a bunch of cowards. You know, what, what is it? Don't you believe in what's taking place here? And he reprim I mean, you look at that whole story. The bottom line of it is the disciples still didn't get the fact that it was Jesus in the boat. They knew it was Jesus, the man. But they didn't realize that it was Jesus, the God man. And in the midst of that storm... Jesus wasn't fearful about the storm because he's the king of the universe. The disciples are waking him up and Jesus stands up and, and basically tells everything to be still and everything smoothed out. And the disciples are like, what just happened? You know, the crazy thing is they've seen him heal people. They've seen all the miracles that Jesus has done. They've just listened to Jesus speak for hours upon hours on the mountainside with all these people. And then they're out on the boat and they're still astonished that Jesus can tell the waves to stop, for the sea to be calm, for the storm to go away. And I believe what, the, the crux of this is really the same thing that takes place in our lives. We can be in relationship with God for decades and experience storms and experience downtimes that shake us to our toes. But it doesn't change the fact that Jesus is Lord. It doesn't change the fact that God is God. And it doesn't change the fact that all we have to do is be able to look to God, the author and the finisher of our faith, and he is the one that controls the storms. He's the one that we go to in the middle of the storms. He's the one that, that, that breaks us out of just living the dream and living in the clouds and brings us down to the fact. In fact, actually, uh, there's a portion of scripture that said, in fact, Jesus said, it said, as surely as sparks fly upwards, so man is born to trouble. You know what? We're going to have trouble. There's going to be storms in our life. Stepping into relationship with God doesn't mean that all your worries go away, that all your storms go away. I've heard that preached before. That is a lie. It doesn't work that way. You never have a problem again if you step into relationship with God. Whoa, we wish that was true. But the truth is, is that there's still going to be storms there. Yeah. The difference is, is that we don't have to do the storm by ourselves. The difference is, is that in the middle of that storm, we can have faith as we look to Jesus and Jesus can speak to the storm and say, peace be still. Now, you know what? It doesn't necessarily mean that, that there aren't some residual things that take place there, but it does mean that God is in control. It does mean that he grabs a hold of that storm and makes it go the other way and, and, and basically turns it around. The disciples here needed to experience the power of Jesus and understand who he was. And I believe it's the same experience that God brings each of us here in this room to experience this very day. When we're faced with storms, when we're faced with rough seas, when we have to make a choice as to where our priorities are, it makes us take a hard look at ourselves. 
Many Christians present life as something that doesn't have any bumps. Well, we know it does have bumps. There's a portion of scripture, Matthew chapter 8, verse 22, if the worship team will come back up. It says, first things first, your business is life, not death. Follow me, pursue life. I think that's what, if Jesus was standing here today, I think that's what he would tell each of us. He would look us straight in the eye and say, hey, first things first, your business is life, not death. Follow me and pursue life. It's an opportunity that we have to have as a theme as we go into 2022. Are we going to pursue life? Are we going to realize that those storms are always going to be there? But Jesus has promised that he would give us life and a bigger and better life than we could possibly wrap our, wrap our head or our minds around. And that's available for each of us here today. What it does, it basically is available as we open up our hearts and say, God, I'm going to pursue life. You might be here today and maybe you've never stepped into a relationship with Christ. Or maybe you find yourself at a place today that would say, Cal, I, I, I'm not where I should be with God. I look at this brand new year. I'm not ready to pursue life. I need help. All I'm seeing is a storm right now. You know what? God can make a difference in your life this very moment. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. And what I would ask that each of you that are here in this room would pray this prayer silently. Well, I pray it audibly. And I believe that God answers prayers like this if we would just pray them with all of our hearts. And I encourage you, pray for life this morning as I pray right now. Dear God, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you sent Jesus thousands of years ago to die on a cross so that I could be free from my sin. And God, right now, I ask you to forgive me of my sin, my failure, and my mistakes. Make me brand new from the inside out. Right now, God, I make an intentional decision to make you the ruler of my life. Father, I give you each and every area. Father, the good things, but also the bad things. And Father, I pray that as you change me from the inside out, that you will change me into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I give you this year. Father, I pursue life in Jesus' name. Everybody, just keep your head bowed, if you would, just for a moment. If you pray this prayer along with me to pursue life, I just want to know who to pray with and for this week. By a very simple action, if you would just look up across this room and catch my eye, it says, Cal, I'm going to pursue life this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. How many others? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to pursue life. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. God, you've seen each of these that have responded this morning. And you see more than I see. I see physical reactions and physical responses as they've looked up today. But Father, you see all the way into their hearts. And I pray today for your power and your presence and your spirit to be theirs. Father, I pray, Lord, that you will not only confirm in their hearts the decisions and the reactions that they've had today, but, Father, that that, that presence and that spirit and that strength will be theirs tomorrow and next week and next month and throughout this whole year. Father, as we pursue life, as we go the direction you want us to, as, Father, we realize that you're the one that calms our storms. Well, thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.